Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Paul says to this church, you guys are my seal of my apostleship in the Lord. And 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 and, and by the way, the word apostle means in, in, literally in the Greek, sent one. Sent one. One that is sent. Who sent who sent Paul? He he said it wasn't a church that sent him. Who sent? God. Yeah, God sent him. He said, God sent me. And the Lord sent me to to you guys, and you are my seal that God had sent me to you. In other words, just you being a church in existence, the fruit of this church in Corinth, continuing on by the time he writes this letter, this is years after he planted the church, he's writing back to them to answer their questions. He says, you guys are my seal that I really am called as an an apostle. You're my fruit of my ministry. And so people, when they want to know, how do you know if you're really called to minister? Well, what's the fruit? Have you touched any lives? Have you, you know, if you're if you're called as an apostle, you you wear a lot of different spiritual hats in that calling. I mean, Paul was used to to see people get healed. He saw miracles happen. They were they were actually Paul was a tent maker. They he would be making the tents there in the Mediterranean region. It's hot. He'd have his little sweat rag. They call it in Greek he, to wipe his brow, and he'd set it down. And they would come up and they'd sneak up and they'd take his sweat rag. And they they go, Paul, touch this. And then they would take the handkerchief and they go to, to someone who's sick and they'd lay it on the person who was sick and they would recover. And they're, you know, just from, they're like, anything he touched, just snag that tool, whatever he touched, go, go t- touch that guy with it. And they get healed. You know, because they, they knew that God was with this man. And so that is interesting to me that, you know, Paul said, God, God worked many miracles on his behalf but it was so that he could share the gospel with people and he could lead them to his Lord. Now, he says in verse 3, my defense to those who examine me is this. He says, do we not have the right to eat and to drink? And do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and as the brothers of our Lord did and and also Cephas, that's Peter, another name for Peter. He says, don't we have the right... Now, we just went over last week how Jesus had brothers, technically half-brothers, same mom, different dad. He had, Jesus had God the Father, his, the Holy Ghost as his dad, but Mary as his mom. But remember, Joseph kept Mary a virgin until she gave birth to Jesus. Then, we read in, in Mark's Gospel, in chapter 13, verse 55, that Jesus had brothers. Mary and Joseph then had relations and Jesus went on to have four, the name's four of the brothers. And it says, and sisters. So he's at least the oldest of seven. I love this part because coming from a big family, I used to think of Jesus as the only child. That it's not fair, man. He doesn't know what it's like to have to have hand-me-downs and, and hand, you know, Mike is hand-me-ups. I was smaller than my next brother in line, so he grew faster than me. I got his, what a disgrace. I got his clothes handed down or up. Hand it up to me. I had hand me ups. Not hand me. They was like, oh, Jesus, you don't understand what siblings, what they can do to you and how they get under your skin and you just want to punch them. And, you know, and I thought, you're an only child. That's what I thought until I read the Bible. Now, here's another proof that Jesus did have brothers. But, you know, growing up in a Catholic upbringing, we weren't taught to read the scripture carefully and see these things. So we were just taught whatever the, whatever the priest taught us. You know, the tradition was that Jesus was an only child. And, G- and that Mary was perpetually kept as a virgin. That's they, they teach the perpetual virginity of Mary in many of the Catholic churches. And I'm like, that's not in the scripture. But, you know, that's what happens when you deviate from the book. So stick to the book. The good book will tell you the details. Now he says, Paul says, now, or do only Barnabas and I have a right to refrain from working? Or, or the NIV says, is it only I and Barnabas that have to work for a living. Remember, Paul was making tents, and he's like, guys, you know, are we the only guys that have to work for a living? And he says in verse 7, 
Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? And who plants a vineyard and doesn't get to eat the fruit of it? And who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? He says, I am I'm not speaking these things according to human judgment, am I? Or does not the law also say these things? For it is written in the law of Moses that you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. Now that's in Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. He says, and God is not concerned about the oxen, is he? He says, or is he speaking altogether for our sake? Yes, he says, for our sake it is written, because the plowman ought to plow in hope, the thresher ought to thresh in hope of sharing the crops. Now he says, if we, if we sow to spiritual things to, in you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share the right over you, then do we not the more? Nevertheless, Paul says, we did not use this right, but we endured all things so that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. And he says, do you not know that those who perform sacred services, the, the, the sacred services eat the food of the temple and that those who, who attend regularly to the altar, that they get to have their share from the altar? And so also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel that they are to get their living from the gospel. Now Paul says, but I, I have not, uh, I have used none of these things. He says the, the guys that proclaim the gospel are supposed to get their living from the gospel. Remember the priests in the temple, where, where were they supposed to get their food? They're doing all the preparation of the sacrifices, the burnt offerings and everything, and, and they're working hard. I mean, if you've ever had to slaughter an animal and, and break it down and, and prepare it for the sacrifice, I mean, it'd be like doing the work of a butcher. Some people have never done this. It's work. Right, Robbie? Breaking down? It's work. And people... People who have never done it, they're like, I don't know about that. I just go to the grocery store, it's under cellophane, you know, in little foam trays. So it's like done, you know. Said, That's not how it comes, you know. Meat doesn't come like that. And, 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 yeah. and when the people would bring their sacrifices and they would lay their hand on the head of the animal while it was alive and they confessed their sins, the law required that, that, that the life was in the blood and the covering for sin. What was the covering for sin? The blood. It costs life to cover death because the wages of sin is death. And so they were, God was showing that there was a, a sacrifice that had to be made. Every time you sin, it has to be paid for with life. Now this was, some people are like, boy, he was uptight with animals. No, it says that that was a foreshadow of what he was going to do when he would send a perfect lamb. Because it, remember, the law required a perfect sacrifice. And they, they look for perfect, unblemished lambs, you know, and rams and different things for, for, for sacrifices. But when Jesus showed up, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away... The true sacrifice is right there. Who takes away the sins. Not covers up the sin, takes it away. And so this is, this is something that, you know, when, when the priests did their work, and you read in Deuteronomy, they were, they were there attending to the altar, and they were supposed to take from the altar the portion of meat for them to eat. That they actually got their, that's how they got their sustenance. It was, in, it was written in the law, like, these guys are serving the people, doing this spiritual service of offering their sacrifices, and they get to reap the material um, benefit of, they get, they get their food supplied for them as part of doing their job. I mean, it was, like, it, it was a job where God says, look, I, I care about the guys that are in the temple working. If, you, if your job was to work in the temple, if your job was even as a worship leader, did you know that the, the tithes that were brought in in the Old Testament were supposed to take care of the worship leaders, to take care of the singers, to take care of the whole... I mean, and the Lord took issue because by the time you read about this in, in well, Second Chronicles um, 29 and 30, you read about the king, that the people had neglected doing this until the day of Hezekiah. I love this guy. This king, he, he was cool. He says, guys... We've robbed the Lord. We, we, have, you know, we haven't attended to what the Lord would want. And he instituted, he, uh, as the king, he said, everyone, we need to go back to, to serving the Lord. We need to take care of his house, his temple, um, bring, in the, bring in the offerings. We need to take care of the priests. I mean, and there's a passage that really broke my heart when I read this. I don't know, how many of you read Nehemiah? The story of Nehemiah. He was one of the exiles that, 
Remember in the days when Daniel got carried away with his buddies Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego? They got carried to Babylon. Well, guys, that happens in the scripture about 600... I'm, I'm just rounding off just for people's minds a little easier to remember. Around 600 B.C. this happens. They go into captivity. Now, the Bible says that that captivity would last for 70 years because they didn't let the land rest. Every seventh year, they were supposed to let it have one year of rest before they tilled it again. And it was 490 years since they had come out that they did not let it rest. When, when you know, the Lord brought them into the promised land with Joshua, He said, you guys didn't obey me in this. So since you didn't let the land rest 490 years, Every seventh year, divide 490 by 7, what is it? 70. 70 times 7 is 490. They didn't let the land rest for 490 years. The Lord says, I will give the land its rest. Because you didn't honor me, I'm going to drive you away from the land. And that's what he did. He drove them to Babylon. The southern kingdom of Judah was carried away to Babylon. Now they're, they're cousins, or you call it, they're kin, kinsmen to the north. The northern kingdom of Israel had already been carried away into captivity to Syria years before because they wouldn't listen to the Lord. They were doing wickedness. They were offering up to, to false gods and up in the north in, in the tribe of Dan. They had set up a, 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 a golden calf and they were, they were actually worshiping it and saying, oh, don't go down to Jerusalem to the temple. We just worship right here. We got our own golden calf. Let's make our offerings here. The Lord said, you guys need to repent. And he sent he sent a bunch of prophets to them to tell them repent. They didn't listen. So the Lord said, if you don't listen, you go into captivity. And I mean, he sent, you talk about a power pack of prophets that he sent. He sent Elijah, the prophet. Remember Elijah in the Bible? And he sent Obadiah and Elisha and Jonah. You guys know the story of Jonah. And Hosea. He sent all those prophets to the northern kingdom. They still didn't listen. So the Lord, around 725 B.C., he took them to Syria. And then he told the southern kingdom through prophets like Isaiah and Micah and Zephaniah and, and Nahum. He said he, he, Habakkuk. And, and then finally Jeremiah. For 40 years Jeremiah wept over Israel. Said you guys have got to repent of your sin. And they didn't listen. So the Lord goes okay off to captivity you go. And around 600 BC they get carried away to Babylon. And they spend this time there for 70 years. Now, 70 years later, the Lord says the time is fulfilled. And Daniel was alive. He's reading this in the scripture. And he went, the scripture says that the captivity will end. And sure enough, Daniel lives to see the end of the captivity to the king of Babylon. But, I don't know if you guys know history. Did all of the Israelites then just run back to Israel after the, after the captivity was officially ended? You know, after Nebuchadnezzar gets, um, well, he gets attacked, and uh, his son gets in there, Belteshazzar, and then after that comes the Medo-Persian Empire. They come in and attack and take over. And Artaxerxes, he winds up, um, he winds up in power uh, down the road from this. And it comes to about 400, 450 BC, and uh, and. This man, it's really 458, if I remember it. For people, some people like timelines, so I'm just telling you. Ezra and Nehemiah. Nehemiah is in the king's court, Artaxerxes' court. And he hears word that back in Jerusalem, the temple is in uh, ruins, the city is torn down, and, he, and, and it's his people. But he's over in the land of Susa, the capital of what we would say at that time is the replacement for the Babylonian Empire, the new kingdom that has arisen. And he's over there. He hasn't gone home. But when he hears word from home, even though he's... I don't know that Nehemiah had ever been to Jerusalem. But it pricked his heart. And he said, Man, we need... This is, makes me sad. And he was a cupbearer to the king. And he brought in the king's cup. If you read Nehemiah chapters 1 and 2, and the king's like, Why are you so solemn? Why are you so down? He's like, I got bad word that my brethren back in... Jerusalem, it's all torn down and it's, you know, laid waste. The temple is not doing well. And, and the king goes, well, what could I do for you? Now, how'd you like the king to ask you, what can I do for you? You know? You're like, well, if you could give me permission to go back and, you know, like, kind of help him out, rebuild the, the wall and, 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 you know, dusty up the temple and get everything. And, 
yeah, yeah. Well, how long would it take you? The king asked him. And he says, well, I'm paraphrasing, but he's like, how long? Well, I think it'd take about this much time, this many years, you know. And But it, he goes, well, aren't you going to need some, some money and some funds to take care of that? And he's like, yeah, if you could give me a letter that gives me permission to get some timbers from the forest that you have and have some guys help me carry the timbers over there and help me get all the materials. And So the king's like, yeah, okay, I'll do it for you. You talk about the coolest story. I mean, this guy goes from being a servant in the, to this king that we don't actually know whether he knew God or not. Yet, Nehemiah was used to, to, as an instrument to go back to Jerusalem and gather all the stuff they needed for the building project and go back and see this, this stuff restored. And, and once they get the temple back together and they get everything together... Um, if you read about this in the book of Nehemiah, let me show you, in Nehemiah chapter 13. Then he says in verse 10 of chapter 13, he says, And thus I also discovered that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them, so that the Levites and the singers who performed the service, they had gone away, each to his own field. They, they weren't getting the, the money they needed to stay in, in, the, in, you know, like we would say, um, you know, the church that has a, a worship leader, um, music mi- minister of music on staff. He wasn't getting paid, and he couldn't afford to take care of his family, so he goes back home and starts working, you know, his own fields so that he could take care of his family. And he says, so, so I reprimanded the officials, Nehemiah said, and said, why is the house of God forsaken? And then, then I gathered them together, and I restored them to their posts. And all Judah then brought their tithe of grain and of wine and oil into the storehouses. And in charge of the storehouses I appointed Shemaliah the priest, and Zodak the scribe, and, and Padiah the Levites, and in addition to them was Hanan the son of Zachar, and, and Mataniah, for they were considered reliable. And it was their task to distribute the, the tithes to their kinsmen. And Nehemiah says, Remember me for this, O my God, and do not blot out my loyal deeds which I performed for the house of God. And for his services, this this man who's a we would say a a servant of a king in a different country says, "God, please remember me that I that I got them to come back to you know basically having services again." This is the nation had quit; they had quit having their services. Can you imagine the Jewish nation not having services at their temple? But this at this time of their history, they didn't. And this man Nehemiah came in and said. Hey, excuse me, um, you know, to the king. We, it, they need some help rebuilding and getting here. Once they get all rebuilt, he's like, where's the people who serve here? I mean, aren't the Levites supposed, isn't there a whole tribe that's supposed to do nothing but serve the house of the Lord? Do, I don't know if you guys know the law, but literally the Levites were given an inheritance from God and they were told that their, their, that their portion would come from their service to the Lord. They were to rotate through the house of the Lord. And God would supply what they need. But how did he supply their needs? From the tithes that came in. You know, somebody asked me, how do you make it, Pastor? I said, he said, a lot of miracles. You know, I was raised up in, in, a, in a movement, Calvary Chapel, that Chuck Smith used to teach us pastors at the small group of men. You know, how do you know when God's calling you to a ministry? And how, does, how, how do you, you know, does, do you guys at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, send out guys and help fund the outreaches and the church plantings? They go, no. Chuck, you say, where God guides, God provides. And some guys hated this. They're like, well, then how can you plant churches? And he says, well, if God's calling you to do it, God will, God will provide what you need. And some of the guys are like, well, that's not fair. I'm going to go work with another denomination. They at least pay you and send you out. And, and, and Chuck said, this is how he found out who, God's, who God called Versus who men called. Because he saw a lot of people that were in ministry that he could see, you know, the guy really, he only is doing this because somebody is paying him to go do it. And Paul, Paul actually says, that, look at this in back to Corinthians. He said, if I, I didn't use my right to, to take um, a living from the gospel, even though everyone who proclaims the gospel has the right, to, to get their living from it. He says, I didn't use that right. And I'm not writing these things so that it will be done so in my case. He's not saying, now go ahead and send me money. You, you notice this about Paul? Paul never takes up an offering for himself. 
He only took up offerings for the poor in Jerusalem. He said, and so in my case, he said, for it would be better for me to die than to have any man make my boast an empty one. Because Paul's attitude, look, here, we find out his heart right here, verse 16. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. But for if I do this voluntarily, though, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have a stewardship that's entrusted to me. What then is my reward? That when I preach the gospel, I may offer the gospel without charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. Paul says, his heart was, I'll make tents and take, in the book of Acts we read, he said, my hands have, have worked hard to take care of my own needs and the needs of the men that are with me. He didn't only make enough from his tent making to pay for himself. He, he sold enough tents and made enough tents, labored hard at it so that he could, he could take care of all of the guys that traveled with him. So that he, he and I, I respect this, I really, I have always wished I could somehow make a living and preach the gospel for free. It, it, you know, if, if someone came to me and say, Pastor, I'm going to just give you enough money that you never have to work, uh, you know, take money from the ministry ever again. I'm just put, setting you up paying your house off, taking care of all your needs. Here you go. And they said, so will you keep preaching the gospel? What do you think my answer would be? You bet, man. I'm going to preach the gospel anyway. But how, what a privilege it would be to be able to have enough that, you know, Paul, I have, by the way, worked many different things to take care of our family in the planting of churches. You know, there's, the, you know, when you plant a church and you've got a couple people, you don't have enough enough support to, even if they, they're tithing, you know, it'd be uh, like, one of the pastors said, wouldn't it be wonderful if everyone tithed like the Bible says they're supposed to? Like, because would the pastor actually be strained and praying, oh God, let us have di dinner tonight, you know, and I remember Ch John Higgins saying they, they had, they didn't have enough food to eat, and he was in charge of a, a hippie commune ministry called Shiloh Houses, and he was just praying, oh God, we don't have enough to, to feed the people tonight, and and they would, as a group of, of all these hippies, they would go work in the strawberry fields and pick the fields. And then they would, the, the farmer would pay to the ministry a, a check and that would be just enough to go buy the discount big package of meat and the discount beans and all this stuff. And then they would go back to the hippie commune and make a big, you know, pot of chili type thing. And he said, we ate a lot of chili. You know, we ate a lot of beans and rice. We ate a lot of, you know, we'll call peasant food, you know, but just getting by because that's... We, and, and the way that they could supply for the whole ministry was by sheer numbers of them, even though it was um, not considered skilled labor. They could tackle jobs where, like, oh, they want that house torn down. And John used to bid the job. We'll, t we'll, we will, we'll take it down. Um, and we'll even reclaim some some of the materials so that you know you tell a person it's not going to go to waste and and they literally with just sheer numbers would come in and pull all the nails out of the beams and take the panels of wood and take the windows out and take it back to the to the land that they had and okay now we got enough we tear down a couple old cottages and then build a a, a dining hall you know out of the materials and he said the lord provided for them in some miraculous ways just of just just the things that he did and 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 he he said you know it, it was really a, a training in his faith to see and there was one day where they just didn't have the food and he was just stressed and and the and the land that they were on he had made a deal with the owner of the land they made a 10 years before they made a um a deal where we'll use the land for 10 years a lease thing and with an option to purchase it at the end, a big balloon payment. And we'll pay little payments along the way just to, just to like it, appease the owner, but it was, it was a very small amount so that the ministry could, could survive. And so it came down to the week before it's time to, the balloon payment is due, and he told me it was like $78,000 that they owed for the land, the balloon payment. Now this is in the days when 78000 could have been a million to him. He's like... We didn't have it. It was beyond what I mean. He said we didn't even have enough money to get dinner for the for the all the people in the hippie commune. He said, and um, this couple that he had 
shared the gospel with many years before, and um, they were living together at the time, and they were, you know, riding around. They called him and said, oh, you don't know, but you really, you know, you shared Jesus with us, and our lives turned around, and we got married, and our lives are wonderful, and we, we would wonder, could you meet us in town at this coffee shop? We'd like to buy you a, coffee, a cup of coffee, and, um, and we have a little something for you. And I guess town was far away, and he, he, he had a very unreliable car and no money for gas. So he felt like, oh, God, I'm going to use the no money I have, and I'm going to drive all the way. There. And he gets there, and the people, um, they, they buy him coffee, and he's like, I, you know, John was not a big coffee drinker. So it's kind of like, this is all a waste of my time. And they go, here, we have something for you. And she handed a little check to him, it was folded, and, and he just glanced at it, and he thought it said $78. And so he thought, I came all this way. This isn't even enough to buy the groceries we need, Lord. Why did I do this, you know? And, um, and then he drove all the way back complaining. The whole ride home, talking to the Lord in, in his prayer time. Just, Hi, what? You know, it's great that, they, that their lives have gone so well and that their lives have turned around and I'm so happy for them, Lord. But we still need, you said, ask for this day our daily bread. And we still need, and, and the payment is due and we don't have enough to pay for the land. We're going to lose the whole thing. Well, Ten years of labor is going to go down the drain because the owner's going to keep all the buildings we built on the land goes to him. It reverts to him. And he's like, I, I'm so discouraged. And the Lord says, why don't you look in your pocket? And he goes, in my pocket, there's a check for like $78. Ha ha. He goes, look again. And he pulled it out and he looked. It was $78,000. Just what they needed. And I'm sorry, it was, it, it turned out it was a thousand over what they needed to pay off the land. So he goes, we're having steak tonight. You know, they had enough to pay the land and go, go actually buy steak dinner for everyone. And, they, and there was a great rejoicing. What, look what the Lord did. And the guy that bought the, you know, they bought the land from was, shocked. He thought for sure, aha, it's going to come back to me. And, you know, and it didn't. They had enough to pay it off and, and the ministry continued. And John says, we saw miracle after miracle after miracle that the Lord provided. Now these are the guys that helped teach me about the Lord. And I realized, okay, God, you're calling me to go to Hawaii, but we don't have enough money. You're going to have to take care of it. I went to prayer meeting. Guys, feel like Wally over there says, I'm supposed to go to the big island. I don't know how I'm going to you know, and within within two weeks, we were given seven buddy passes. At the time, there was an airline, America West, that flew straight from Tempe to Hawaii. And they, they had opened this route, and they're like, um, we had to pay, like, what is it, $10? You know, it, it was like a ridiculous, um, you know, it was basically a transaction fee at the time, or $100 for, for a, a round-trip ticket from Phoenix to, to the Big Island. And so we, we were like, Okay, I guess we could afford that, Lord. You know, we couldn't afford the the thousand dollar tickets that it was at the time. But okay, okay, we got. But why seven? There's only me and Jan. And then my dad decided, you know, he would come with us. So I had a ticket. He could anyone could use it. You just fill in your name. These buddy passes. So I'm like, okay, that answers that. Well, me and Jan will go out, spy it out, come back. That's two tickets used, and then we'll use two more, and then my dad needs one. You know. And, it turned out that we we had enough for us to make two round trip tickets. The the one ways that the buddy passes were to and the and for my dad, and we all got here and got to come. But my dad didn't know the Lord. He knew about the Lord, but he didn't know him yet. And and he would listen to me for nine months preach the gospel, till he till he would come to the Lord. And I was like, wow, that was. And if you had asked me before, would you go to Hawaii, and and teach the 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 church and oh by the way you're gonna to have to work um, at a flower shop and arrange flowers and deliver them for the people in the church. There's a couple and there and, and then next door there's a couple that owns a beachwear shop and you're gonna to have to sell bathing suits too, you know, to, to earn enough to take care of your family while you're waiting for the church to grow. And would you do that? And oh by the way, you're gonna be mocked by your dad the whole time you do this. For like nine months till he comes to faith. Will you go and do it? Now if you had told me he would come to the Lord Going out of the gate, I would have said, I'll go right away. I love my dad. I wanted him to know the Lord. I prayed for his salvation for 10 years and didn't see any, anything. But my dad had to see me walk the walk of preaching the gospel and trusting God and having miracles like people stop by. Oh, 
Um, you know, we're leaving and we just wanted to drop off our groceries because we, you know, they're going to throw them out at the condo. So here you go. And it was just what we needed to eat. And just, God did that over and over. And I know God was showing off, like, in front of my dad. So my dad would just be like, wow, God really does take care of you, doesn't he? Or like, yeah, he really does. And, and, and Paul, I love Paul, even though he says, I had the right to use, the, the, to take my living from the gospel. He said, for him, he didn't want to do it. And I, I kind of, for me, I wish that I didn't have to take my living from the gospel only from the standpoint of, how many of you guys have seen those of those TV fellows that beg for money? And all their, tell, you know, quote, Bible things. And to me, it's a turn off. And I think if it turns me off, what does it do to the person who's tuning in to hear? You know, I, I want to preach the gospel for free. I want to be able to not have to ever talk about money um, and talk about the Lord. Because that's what makes you come to faith, the Lord. The money thing... It is weird how money does... Well, Jesus said, you can't, you can't serve God and money. God and mammon, riches. you got to choose one or the other. One's going to be your master. I choose to serve God. He'll take care of the money. If you seek God first, He'll add what you need. But, but for some reason, money, like to men, is a sore spot. Some of them, they, they, you know, you start talking money and they're just like, they bristle up. What are you talking about my money for? You know? Well... Guys, God says if you honor Him, He'll open the windows of heaven and He'll pour out blessings on you so you don't have any more need. And Hezekiah, the guy I was telling you about the king in Chronicles, he honored the Lord and God prospered them. God prospered Israel when they began to honor God. There's a principle with money. If you honor God, God blesses you. If you hold back from God, guess what? The windows of heaven don't open up. You don't get blessings until you have no more need. So I tell people, for me personally, and by the way, who knows the answer is, did the priests have to tithe, the Levites? They live from the tithes. Did they have to tithe when they got their portion? Anyone know this? It's not a trick question. It's just the biblical. The answer is yes. See, God even made the priests honor him with their money. They, they Even though they received their living, so as funny as it sounds, I even tithe. I, I received my living from the gospel, and I still tithe as a matter of principle. And when people say, but you don't have very much. Yeah, how can you afford to tithe? I said, I can't afford not to. Because every time I tithe, God does super cool things. He blesses us. Blesses us with granite countertops. You know, that we didn't... I mean, our tile... You guys know my house is old. Welcome to our old house. It's a home. But uh, it's one of the oldest houses in the neighborhood. It's falling apart. And the tiles were kind of going wonky. Not on this bar here this was a this was an extra blessing because we needed 10 inches more of that slab to do downstairs and there was a third slab that we had to buy just to get it and the guy gave it to us cheap well it's my last one you just if you take it i'll give it basically give it to you i was like thank you jesus you know because we needed that little piece at the end to finish the downstairs kitchen and someone blessed us they came a couple months ago and they looked at our month a little over a month ago saw our kitchen and they're like hmm Jan cooks on this? We're like, yeah. She doesn't, she doesn't complain. You know, we'll just use whatever we have. Like, oh, I'd like to get you some new countertops. Like, happy dance, you know? <laughs> like, woohoo! You know, when people say, how can you, how come that happens to you? I go, what's it say? Seek God? And how many things get added to you? Oh. So I want to encourage you. We're starting off the year. The best thing I can encourage you with, since this happens to be where we fell in the lineup of teaching through the scripture, is listen to this attitude. Honor God with all of your life. And watch what he'll do. I mean, if, if, if you haven't, if you have never tried tithing or you, you don't have a discipline of doing it, I encourage you to do it for this next year. Even just do it for a couple weeks. And just because it's the only place in the Bible, in Malachi, it says, test me. God says, this is, the only, this is the only place in the whole Bible God says, you can test me in this. You want to test if God's real? He says, you bring in the tithe and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings on you so you have no more need. If you want to, you want to have a great year, start honoring God with your finances and watch what He does for your life. And it's really cool because 
you'll be telling me the praise reports. Well, you know the story about the land. Well, guess what he did for me, you know? And, and, and you know, when people say, how did that happen for John? Or how did it happen for Chuck Smith? How did it happen for you? I go, because there's a principle. We just honor God with our lives. And tithing is just part of our life. Uh, by the way, I don't look at money as the only thing I tithe to God. You could tithe of your time, you know, to the work of the Lord. You could give of your time. You can give up of, of your, you know, it's not just money resources that we have in this life that we can use for others. There's a lot of things. But it, it's a heart matter. Do you honor God with your life? And if you do, then the Lord blesses you. And there's, so if you have a chance, read First Chronicles 29 and 30 tonight. It's just two short chapters um, about Hezekiah and how he honors the Lord. And it swings the whole nation the whole nation gets prospered because they come back to honoring God. And it's just a beautiful thing. Second Chronicles uh, 29 and 30. It's second or th- Wait, let me just, before I tell you that, I'm going to make sure I, I'm going to look at it. Yeah, Second Chronicles 29 and 30. He reinstitutes the Passover. He gets the Israelites back to serving the Lord. And, and basically, kind of like what a great year-end message to have is Hey guys, let's all just honor God with our lives and, um, you know, put the honor back where the honor is due. And then the Lord blesses the nation of Israel. Second Chronicles 29 and 30. So that's your extra credit reading for fun tonight. And I uh, hope you, if you want, read ne- Nehemiah 13 uh, that we just went to and you'll see how Nehemiah was used. There's two different times in Israel's history, but both were used to see attention given to God's service, you know, and they said, let's build up the house of the Lord. Let's honor the Lord. Let's do what he says. And, and if you read it through those passages, you'll see the result is the nation was blessed because they honored the Lord. Now, I don't know how to get our whole nation to do it, but if I get all you guys to do it, somehow, maybe one of you is going to be friends with the guy who knows the guy in the White House, who gets the, you know. I mean, I'm watching our president actually lead a prayer in Congress. He opened, people were, how dare he do the prayer? And I was like, how cool. I mean, when I was a kid, they would have thought, you know, what a push to that. Okay. But now they're like faulting him. I'm like, something's stirring in him. Because that guy's come from a pretty rough business background. I can't, you think about Trump doing a prayer. I mean, think back to that You're Fired show that he used to do. You know, You're Fired. And, and, and he did that show with the, I forget what it was called. You guys, the Apprentice. The Apprentice. I mean, I never thought of that guy as a prayerful man when he did that show. I, I, I think, man, God might be stirring him. You know, this leading a country might be forcing him to to think, I need some help from upstairs. You know, and I'm just thinking, pray for him. That, the Bible says pray for our leaders, right? But you like him or not, I, I'm not here to win your vote on that. But I am here to tell you, you've got to pray for him. It doesn't matter who's in office. In fact, you even have to pray for the guys who do our roads here. <laughs> Every Saturday, I get the men to pray for whoever's in charge of our road work because they need some help. You know, whether you like them or not, whoever's doing the job, it just seems like it's dragging on. Please, Lord, help. Why don't we close in prayer for that? Father, thanks. Thanks that we can be together on this last service of this year, 2017. We just thank you that we can have a house to come to, Lord. You, just that you would had look after my family all these years, over 25 years. Of miracle after miracle, and I can that I can come and preach about you, and help people to be strengthened in their faith. I thank you for that privilege. I pray, Lord, as we go from here, you would indeed look after the leaders of our nation, the leaders of our community, the leader of the road work, and uh, and that you would you would give them wisdom in their leading, Lord. But especially that they would help lead us back to you. They would be like the Nehemiahs and the Hezekiahs that that help get people's focus back to the service unto you, Lord, that we're to do. And help us be a a, a catalyst in our community and in our sphere of influence that we can help people come back to serving you with a whole heart. I ask that, Lord, we could do that in Jesus' name. And everyone that agreed said, Amen. 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 Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, 
and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.